transitioning now. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us again this evening, uh, this Wednesday night with Capstone Educational Consultants in our series of College Journey Conversations. We're excited to have some special guests with us all the way from sunny Southern Florida. And uh, we, we are so grateful to have uh, Stefano from uh, Lynn University and Freddie from Lynn as well. I'd love for you guys to introduce yourselves. Tell us a little bit about Lynn University uh, from your perspective. And we've got a great subject matter tonight. We're gonna to be talking a lot about changes taking place in higher education and what kind of things are, are we gonna be looking at here in the next uh, mm -hmm. several months, maybe years. And uh, we're just gonna have this conversation tonight. It's gonna to be some great stuff. But uh, Freddie, Stefano, uh, have, us, have us a little, uh, give us a little bit of information. Yeah, sure. Freddie, go ahead. Sure. So my name is Federico Glitman. I actually work with every student from that Georgia region. Mark, thank you, as always, for just supporting our efforts here at the university, giving us this platform to also talk about the trends in higher education. A uh, short story about me, I actually came in 2007 from Buenos Aires, Argentina. Growing up, I always wanted to be a professional soccer player. The way that I describe it is I had a knee injury, but the universe describes it as I wasn't athletically talented. So I actually met Stefano at a college fair, and 13 years later, I'm still here at Lynn University. One of my favorite things about really the university is the innovation that we have behind it. We have this interesting core curriculum called the Dialogues of Learning, in which we're actually teaching students how to problem solve, critical think, how to communicate. We've been fortunate enough that we've actually been an Apple Distinguished uh, School for about a decade now. So our transition from the regular platform to the online platform was very uh, smooth to say the least, that we've been able to focus on who we are more than ever before. And I've heard from quite a few individuals saying, oh, it takes about two to three weeks to transition from being in the classroom to being virtually. It takes a lot more than that. It takes about four or five, even six months. So I'm excited to be part of a very innovative community with just incredible leadership. And I'd like to introduce as well, Stefano. Well, um, good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for having us here um, as your guest, Mark. Uh, um, I am actually, I am in South Florida, and I'm outside, and uh, I hope uh, you're, th there's a train that is coming by, uh, so I hope it's not too much of a, uh, of a back noise, but uh, um, as, uh, you know, just like Freddie, I've been in Lynn for a long time. I'm a Lynn uh, uh, graduate. Uh, I, uh, I'm originally from Rome, Italy, and I came to Lynn. Um, I was actually recruited to play tennis for, uh, for the university. And my initial idea was to come to Lynn for one year as an exchange student, because uh, I was going to the University of Rome uh, before I actually uh, uh, transferred to Lynn. And University of Rome is a very well-known university. Uh, it was a university that was established in 1306. I'll repeat that, 1306. So it's been around for a long time. But it was a... Um, you know, a very large public institution free because, you know, all public institutions in Italy are free and I was doing okay, but I never realized how incredible education could be when you actually can interact with your faculty members, with your professors, with the rest of your class, right? I would go to a, uh, to a, to an, um, uh, to a class with 1,500, 2,000 people back in Rome. I would listen to the professor spit information at me and then I would teach myself, right? To take, uh, you know, a big test. And when I came to Lynn, the most incredible thing is, is, the, is the collaboration that takes place throughout the entire learning uh, process. You know, so each class uh, was, a, um, was an incredible, um, uh, uh, you know, gave, gave me the ability to really learn the material and test the material and, and, and uh, you know, an hands on uh, opportunity to really, uh, to really learn the material that I never experienced before. So about, um, about two, three weeks into my experience at Lynn, I called my parents and I said, remember I told you I was going to be here for a year. I really love this place and I want to graduate from here. 25 years later, I still find myself at Lynn. Um, you know, I served the institution as the uh, director of undergraduate admission and I could not be prouder, prouder of being part of an institution that really uh, to me is, is one of the most innovative, one of the most, uh, you know, phenomenal places in the country right now. Um, one of the things, uh, you know, as Freddie uh, was talking about is the innovation, is the ability for us to really um, connect with this generation of learners, 
right? Everything that we do at Lynn is exactly and specifically designed to serve Generation Z in so many different ways. Freddie mentioned one of them, which is our iPad initiative. And we've been working for uh, with Apple to build this infrastructure, to build a system for over uh, so for almost 10 years. So we started about eight or nine years ago to start connecting with Apple and say, okay, how is this generation really learning? What do they need? How do they learn best? How is the brain wired? What can we do to really cater to their, uh, uh, you know, to their abilities and to their needs? Um, so what we did is that we d designed this platform together. We were one of the first universities in the world to be a test center for Apple, you know, for this new technology. And the iPad had just literally just come out the same year, like the actual iPad technology. So what we did is that uh, we digitized everything. We created a lot of the content for the, uh, uh, for, for the students to learn on. And, uh, and we know that students, uh, Generation Z learns best in an environment that is digital, collaborative, uh, and interactive. And that's exactly what we did. So we have no books at the university. Everything is delivered. Every student receives this iPad Pro and everything they do is done through the iPad. I mean, it's this incredible um, uh, uh, setup where the students that come in, you know, a lot of the high schools are doing this. I don't know why universities are a little bit behind in, in adapting, you know, to this new technology. But our students that come in, they're like, yeah, this is exactly what I'm doing in high school. And, uh, you know, it's a natural progression to what they're doing. And we've built a lot of uh, everything else that we've done. So in the, in the background, you can see a very beautiful building. That's our new uh, university center. And again, this was designed for Generation Z. Like all the spaces in there are designed for Generation Z. We have this, uh, uh, th this, this rooms uh, that, are, that are full of technology study rooms because right now students uh, study in small groups, right? There's a lot of project-based learning that it's done in those groups. So they have all the technology um, that is available to them. The third floor of this building is the largest center for social impact in America within the university uh, uh, in, environment. Because as you know, you probably can tell us that as well. Um, we know that research shows that students nowadays uh, are very interested in giving back. They're interested in finding a job that it actually has a meaning. They want to do well for themselves, but they also want to do good. The other thing that we've done is that we know that Generation Z, they don't really have a schedule like we used to have. You know, we used to have breakfast, lunch, and dinner. They live 24 hours a day. So guess what we did? In that building, we have one of the top uh, food service uh, providers in the country, you know, in, in, in our uh, cafeteria, and is open 24 hours a day, seven days a week for our students. So I... Um, uh, you know, I'm I'm very proud to be part of of such a uh, uh, such a, 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 an educational institution that really provides uh, uh, you know this type of environment, uh, and uh, you know the results that we've seen have been incredible. Our application pool went f two years ago from about three thousand five hundred. Last year we hit ten thousand applications, and this year we're going to hit uh, ten thousand applications again. And for the first time in our history, we actually met the goal on May one, which. Given the, the current situation, I think it's absolutely outstanding. So thank you uh, again, Mark, for giving us this opportunity to come here. Uh, and uh, we've talked about Lynn enough. I, I get very excited, as you can tell. You know, I love uh, I love where I work. I love where uh, you know my alma mater. So um, yeah. I'm excited to be here and uh, and share with you some uh, um, some great information about Lynn or about anything else in general. Well, it's a, it's certainly a very exciting place. Now, just to kind of get our bearings. Mm -hmm. um, Lynn is located in Boca Raton, Florida. Boca Raton, right in between West Palm Beach and Fort Lauderdale, about an hour north of Miami. Okay, and so that gives us kind of a, a proximity so we can get our minds wrapped around when we say South Florida, what we're talking about. And I know I've been on your campus. Uh, I've seen your programs in, in action, and um, I, I'm, I'm very amazed and very jealous of of the, the technology that's there. Uh, I certainly wish I had that at my fingertips, but of course, you know, we didn't even have a computer then. So we're pretty, I'm pretty excited for the students today to have that type of resource available to them. Now, I've got to tell our viewers real quick that if you'd like to ask uh, either Freddie or uh, Stefano a question about Lynn University, uh, we'd be more than happy to ask them on your behalf. Uh, if you just want to write write in the comment section a question. We'll definitely get around to that and, and make sure your question gets answered along this, this, uh, this route. 
Uh, we're excited to talk about a subject tonight that I think is uh, one that's just about to kind of explode in higher education. And that is, uh, it's changing. And it's changing right in front of our very eyes. And uh, how it is changing is uh, perhaps one of the more intriguing questions uh, that's being asked because nobody can really put a finger on what that looks like. Right, and I would anticipate that there are going to be some changes on Lynn's campus, um, and we'll talk about some of those. I hope throughout the evening. But uh, one of those big changes that has taken place more recently, you know, here we are on May sixth, and uh, five days after what has always been known as Decision Day, May first. And uh, this was the year that Decision Day kind of took on a whole new face. Uh, but then, of course, because of all the uh, coronavirus uh, issues, it took on a very different, different face, right? Um, and so some schools are actually moving back to June 1, uh, pushing it back. Um, and that's causing quite, uh, quite a, a lot of questions with regards to, you know, who should I deposit to first or what if? this deposit doesn't hold and I wanna do, can I do two? Uh, so tell us, talk to us a little bit about how that, how you're seeing uh, decision day unfolding and whether or not this is gonna be something in the future to kind of uh, pay attention to. You wanna uh, take that Freddie uh, first or uh, for me to go? Whatever you wanna go do. Ahead. Go ahead, okay. So um, what we've seen, there's a there's been a, a uh, I think every university, most universities in the country went through that, uh, um, that, that, that um, decision-making process. You know, do we stay with May 1? Do we extend the deadline? If we extend the line, why do we extend the deadline? What is the, uh, uh, you know, what are we going to achieve by extending the deadline? Uh, and what, how do we feel it's going to benefit the students uh, as well as the university, right? So it's always uh, a, a combination of, uh, um, you know, what, what's going to happen to the university, what's going to happen to the, uh, uh, to, to, to the, to the funnel, and what's going to happen to the students. Uh, um, there have been about 500 institutions in the country that have moved their deadline. Uh, past May 1 and over onto uh, most institutions uh, have gone with uh, with June 1, right? At Lynn, we decided to stay with, with May 1. Uh, you know, we felt uh, that the students, uh, um, you know, that, that extra month was not really going to provide any additional, you know, decision-making power. I mean, our uh, financial aid packages are out. Our, um, uh, you know, we, we are, we've talked to the students enough and that we feel that they should be able to make the final decision by May 1, right? And then, you know, then we can work everything else, you know, throughout the summer. I believe that our decision from, and this is from an enrollment management standpoint, right? Because at the end of the day, um, uh, you know, we have to make sure that we have a class that it's coming in and it's the class that we're trying to shape for what we need. Uh, we made we made an incredible, I think, you know, right decision because we actually had the largest uh, commitment ever in the history of the university by May one, um, and that had never happened at Lynn before. And I and I truly believe is that uh, you know Lynn has been uh, um, really changing very very quickly, you know, and the fact that we adapted so much to Generation Z and and everything that we do is exactly what this generation is really looking for in a educational institution. So it has allowed us to, to really stand um, apart, be, uh, you know, have completely be different from other institutions. Uh, and for many of our students, this is a very clear choice, right? They're not really undecided, you know, like if, if they can make it work financially, that's where they want to go. We went from being, uh, um, you know, one of those universities that, uh, that was kind of like, you know, we were doing the same things that everyone, everybody else was doing. Now, 93% of our students tell us that Lynn is the number one, number two choice institution, 70% being number one choice. So um, I, I think that's been a, a very important uh, uh, differentiator for us, uh, you know, in that decision-making process. So we decided to say we may one because we knew that if a student had decided on Lynn, they wanted to come to Lynn. They weren't going to wait 
until June one, and uh, and uh, you know, and and we kind of, uh, um, uh, you know, bet that that was going to be the case, and uh, and and it really paid off, uh, you know, and, uh, and we're very very excited, uh, you know, that so many students uh, considered Lynn a top choice. You know, colleges are discouraging. Um, and all we, you know, always have, as well as counselors and consultants like myself, uh, discourage this uh, idea of double depositing, right? Um, the, the idea of depositing to an institution because that's where you've chosen to go uh, and then retracting your applications from those you've chosen to not attend um, out, of, out of respect is, is kind of the rule of thumb. And with with varying deposit days, May 1, now June 1, it seems as though there's the uh, possibility of double depositing happening. In fact, I've read some reports saying that, um, you know, there's an encouragement to like hold, you know, put a deposit and then, and then maybe you put a deposit somewhere else just in case, uh, you know, you come off the wait list or, you know, it, it, in case you're on a wait list, deposit and then if you come off the wait list you can lift that one and go to the other one you know so there's some really really interesting uh strategies that are out there um and freddie I, I, i'd be very interested to hear your your thoughts on that and your take on that and, and that's a valid question mark i think right now we're going through an uh, as we know we're going through a world pandemic unprecedented times that for many families they're having that difficult conversation of Am I able to afford milk next week? Am I able to afford our three meals a day? Does it drop down to one meal a day? So it's unprecedented times for families as we're going, as while well, we wait for the economy to reopen. But I think when you look through it on the larger landscape, I always try to find silver linings in unfortunate cir circumstances. And the silver lining behind COVID-19 is it's time for us to readjust and reimagine and reinvent not only the admission process, but our educational system. For example, in regards to double depositing, we know, I'm, to give you an example, all my family's back in Argentina, so it's just me here in my apartment, been reading about two or three books a day. I just finished The Truth About College Admission, and it's what you and I have always spoken about, Mark. It's finding your purpose and finding your why. We know that one of the most controversial topics right now is what happens in the fall if college football doesn't reopen? All that lost revenue all those uh, merchandising, all those ticket sales, X, Y, and Z. So when it comes to double depositing, it's important for families to figure out why are they attending this institution for this purpose? At the end of the day, somehow through, during these last few decades, the concept has become more about the acquisition of SAT and GPA rather than the acquisition of healthy minds, of cognitive minds, of minds that can problem solve to the aspect that now we have to sit down as a family during our dinner time because you know what, we really can't go anywhere else and have those conversations of, okay, we're down to these three schools. What major is best suited for you? What internships are going to be best suited for you? From the college landscape, we know a few things. We know the public uh, state system, excuse me, the state school system and community colleges and state colleges, they're gonna flourish. With families being uncertain about their economical standings at this time, those institutions can flourish. Unfortunately, there will be schools that will be closing. There's been a few announcements recently, and those schools have been maybe have not been meeting their enrollment goal for the past couple of years, that this COVID-19 was just unfortunately the last nail in the coffin for them, which is extremely unfortunate for our colleagues. But it's sitting down with families and having that conversation. We're human beings on the admission side. If you need extensions, I would be shocked by how many schools will say no to it. Because at the end of the day, as Stefano mentioned, you have to meet enrollment goal, you have to meet that class, but colleges are a business and we do have to provide resources for students to be successful. So in regards to double depositing at the end of the day, it's sitting down to the simplistic matter of why am I going to lend? What opportunities are going to be um, rising for me? What internships, what career placement? I think those are the four important questions each family should be asking themselves before they submit a deposit and their commitment. That's a very good point, Freddie. And uh, there's, there's bigger issues at stake here, I think. And as you very well, uh, very well pointed out. Now I know for a fact that uh, a significant number, 
uh, in your enrollment are international students. Uh, you have a significant portion of your student body mm -hmm. from other countries, and uh, that's commendable. Uh, and the idea of the diversity on your campus, um, given, given all that you offer, is uh, really commendable. However, now, you know, with all that's taking place, um, one significant change that many college campuses, not just Lynn University, but many um, are going to be experiencing that big question mark as to whether or not their international students are going to either be able to stay or arrive. Um, and so how, how, how do we see that playing out either, you know, as, as more specifically on your campus at Lynn, but you know, even as as a, as a whole in higher education, how because so many and there's such a significant uh, dependence upon the international student body. Um, we're hearing it in the news, and we're hearing it uh, across the board uh, of how important they are in driving what is happening in higher education. Um, we we rely pretty heavily on our international flavor, right? Uh, on our campuses, and that, that's very important. So uh, address that with us, if you will, tonight. Yeah, so uh, one of the things that, uh, that is important to know, I remember looking at the uh, um, uh, IIE data, right, uh, that um, um, it's, it's the organization uh, that kind of, uh, uh, you know, keeps track of all the international students uh, uh, here in the, uh, in the U.S., uh, and I believe that uh, um, that international student, uh, as a if, if we look at it as a as an import, right? Because that's what it is. It's an import, and it's a uh, it's a budget line on the uh, on the uh, on the GDP. Uh, is the fifth or the sixth largest uh, um, uh, uh, item on that? Uh, so it's it's a lot of uh, um, it's a big economical uh, economic impact that it has on the uh, on the U.S. economy. Um, I believe it's in the excess of thirty billion dollars. Uh, um, don't quote me on that because I might be uh, wrong, but I think it's around that uh, that ballpark. Uh, so, uh, not having uh, international students be able to move freely around the world to come and study in the U.S., you know, will impact uh, not only universities but the uh, the the, the uh, U.S. economy as a whole. Um, so that's uh, that's uh, uh, you know one of the um, impacts that we'll see. Um, oh, uh, unfortunately, because of this of this global pandemic, uh, I mean, I'm an I'm an optimist by nature, so I am thinking that by August, uh, you know, when when most universities will start again with their full term, we'll be able to, you know, to reopen uh, that our international students uh, that are our, you know embassies and consulates will be open all around the world, and and we'll be able to welcome. Uh, those uh, those students. Obviously, there's going to be probably different precautions, right? That that will need to be taken, uh, you know, within the campuses. But I'm uh, I'm hoping that, uh, that that we will be open. Um, one of the things that uh, um, that a lot of universities are doing is that's giving the students uh, the opportunity to do their first semester um, um, online, basically, right? Because that's the uh, that's one thing that will buy us some time. Uh, you know, want completely. Uh, disrupt the educational experience for the students because they'll still be able to get the uh, the number of credits that they need to complete, you know, that first semester and then just come in in January, right? And in the big scheme of things, that's just a little dot in the uh, you know in the in the student experience, and it's something that I think it's it's very feasible and should be really taken seriously, not only by universities uh, that, that are already working on it, but by the students. You know, it's 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 okay. You do one semester online and then you come in. And Lynn, one of the uh, options that we have available is to split the first semester in two quarters, basically, right? We're a semester school, but we're thinking, uh, you know, instead of having a 15-week semester, having two seven or eight-week uh, mini-masters, if you will. So, um, so we can buy ourselves not necessarily the entire semester, but maybe half a semester, so students can do the first two or three classes online and then come on campus, uh, let's say at the, you know, the middle of October or towards the end of October and complete you know, the, that first semester on ground. So that's one of the, uh, I, I think the innovative approaches that we're bringing to the, uh, to the table for, for our students. Uh, uh, we haven't formally announced anything 
because we are of the mindset that in uh, you know that we're going to be fully open but that's one of the options that we have available that we can uh, um you know kind of uh, utilize in case that uh, we see that that the uh, the pandemic doesn't slow down yeah you raised an interesting point about you know campuses across the country um are having to like really think through how creative they can be with their their semesters you know we We've been in this uh, semester, first semester, second semester mindset, and some of them have quarters, you know, first, second quarter, and then a, a third and fourth quarter um, mindset. Some even even have a uh, one class at a time type mindset. Block schedule, yeah. Yeah, block schedule. Um, but but I'm more inclined to think of uh, difficulty in families agreeing to pay an on-campus experience uh, price for an online education, even if it's for a, a, a limited amount of time. Um, would you agree with that? So um, interestingly enough, uh, so uh, earlier on today, uh, I had a, uh, a meeting with all the, um, so there is an organization here in Florida called PCAF, Private Colleges and Universities of Florida. And all the director of admissions meet uh, twice a year. And uh, today was the day that we actually had, uh, you know, our first uh, virtual meeting. And uh, that was the, the question that I actually was posed um, to the, uh, you know, to the group. And, uh, you know, and the question was like, is your university going to lower the fees, you know, for the online program? And the answer was that a cost is actually more expensive for a university to teach an online course than it, than it is to teach an on-ground course, you know, from a... Uh, um, a technology perspective. Uh, I mean, you have to pay the professor the same amount of money that you pay whether or not the professor teaches on ground or teaches online. The, the credits have the same exact worth um, that, you know, whether you take them online or you take them, uh, you know, on ground. Our students are already have the option of, of the five courses that they take on ground. They can take one or two courses online if they wish, you know, like if they're athlete, an athlete, and they need to be a little more flexible, they can take an online course. It's not that the course costs any less. So um, at the end of the day, I think you can have a, uh, um, uh, you know, both both ways you can have your, your argument, but um, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I'm, I'm sure that there's going to be a number of universities that are gonna lower their, their price and the number of universities that are, that are gonna keep it the same. Um, mind that um, most of the students will not have to be responsible to pay for room and board, which is already, uh, you know, a, a large number, uh, you know, and a lot of uh, savings. Right. So a lot of the, a lot of those co costs are wrapped up in room and board, and, and that's understandable. Raz, thank you for posting uh, your comment there. Uh, certainly appreciate it. Um, you, you know, our, our viewers are very concerned about this because they, they have uh, some of our fellow consultants are having families that are asking this question and are concerned about this particular aspect of, you know, paying such a premium price for what feels or seems as though it's not so much of a premium experience. And um, they're missing out on the interaction with fellow students, they're face to face with their professors, um, you know, the, the collaboration that's taking place in learning groups. Um, all of this is missing when they're having to have that online experience instead of um, their classroom experience. So this is something that's a, a huge transformational change that is uh, potential in our very near future, if not this next semester, um, that we might be looking at. Some schools are going on more of a hybrid approach where they might take some of those classes as mentioned by Rick Clark from Georgia Tech this morning in a meeting I was in where they might take some of the larger classes uh, that have a huge population and put those online and, and then be able to exercise some of those smaller classes with, um, with, that, with that more social distancing kind of mentality. Yeah, as I, as I said before, Mark, I mean, that's, this is a real problem, right, that, uh, that universities uh, are facing, that students will have to face, uh, uh, you know, if we go to that, uh, I know a number of universities have already um, made it public that they will be teaching the first semester online, but, um, um, you know, I'm on the mindset that we're going to get started in, uh, in August, and we're going to be able to provide, uh, you know, the type of environment that we uh, 
um, that we that we've always provided. And then uh, uh, you know we'll get we'll get to the bridge. You know we'll we'll cross the bridge once we get to it. Uh, and uh, you know if we have to make that decision where there there's going to have to be you know a, a hybrid approach or maybe an online approach for for the first month, two months, whatever whatever it may be. You know then a decision will be made. But uh, you know. Um, universities have to continue being uh, uh staying alive right yeah. and uh and and if you're not uh you know it, the, the, there's there's a large cost associated with having you know a large uh, number of uh, professors uh, you know that whether they teach online or they teach on ground uh, you know they have and um you know uh, we've had incredible and i'm going to go back to a little bit to the lin experience we've had an incredible feedback you know because of, of our technology that we have, we've been able to continue teaching online for the students that are now in, uh, 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 you know, at home uh, for the spring semester, the current students, uh, you know, and we've switched almost seamlessly to an online uh, to an online program. And it's uh, it's been, uh, you know, you were talking about group projects, you were, you were talking about interaction. I mean, there's a lot of interaction that, that goes along, you know, when in a, in a, in a session, where everybody is on the screen at the same time, then you're teaching, uh, you know, you're not listening to a recording or you're not just answering, a, 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 you know, a chat. You're actually interacting. You're actually talking. You're actually speaking. You're actually being asked questions. So I, I you know, yes, of course, it's not the same as being in class and, and kind of feeling maybe the atmosphere, but it's very similar. So, uh, and we try to make it, uh, you know, as, as uh, seamless as possible, you know, to what the, uh, the, the real experience is. Freddie, you look like you're about to explode up there. So what, what are you thinking? No, not necessarily explode, but it's, it, it's, you're asking the uncomfortable questions to get the right answers, Mark. Yeah. And even before we began, I mean, the conversation you and I had that at the end of the day, schools are not designed for social distancing in yeah. theory though. But if, if you think about it in practice, how many companies are no longer having that one building because they cut overhead and so many of their individuals are working from home and working in group collaborations. Yes, we do have that concept in our mind that college should be that academic and social environment. However, though, when did college, and first of all, I'm a big fan of the recent um, appointment of Angel Bettis as the new NICAC CEO. And, and I've heard him speak a few times, but we also bring up the question, when did we move ourselves from the purpose of college, which is to educate young minds and develop them to become contributing members of society to what Stefano mentioned that Ruben Board plays a big role. Why do students need a steakhouse? Why do they need a movie theater in the residence halls? Why do they need a lazy river on campus? The purpose behind college is to develop those skills to prepare you for the real world. Because at the end of the day, 10 years from now, we're going to have positions and careers and jobs that aren't popular and haven't been created yet. When I was a student at Lynn, who would have thought that being a social media specialist is going to be such a contribution behind a business, behind a company? So in theory, I think it's, it's unfortunate that students may not have that one-on-one -on -one interaction. But if we're speaking realistically, many of these students, I mean, with our iPhones, with our Android, with our smartphones, we're communicating with everybody from all over the world. Even before our session, I was texting with my parents back in Argentina. And that's what this generation is having. As Stefano described, Lynn University is built for Generation Z, but it's also time that education becomes in focus on Generation Z. They no longer want to have those quote unquote college algebra courses. They want to know, how can I manage a checkbook? How can I mortgage a house? The best example, I'm a big sports fan. And unfortunately, when Kobe, uh, Kobe Bryant passed away, I was away from campus, but I texted our sports management faculty member, and he brought up the best point that I think our whole educational system should really em embody, which is just because you're in the classroom for 15 minutes, the world doesn't stop. So with the use of technology, what, what he was able to do was stop his course and really revolve his course around what happened with Kobe Bryant that day. So yes, unfortunately, colleges are not designed for social uh, distancing, yet yeah, we practice social distancing, distancing unconsciously, and we see it with corporations, with multinationals. Again, you could have the CEO have his office in a certain area with his top leadership team, but
But the trickle down effect, everybody may be working from home, which is what we see more often. So I actually think this COVID-19 is going to prepare us for what sometimes we refuse to see, which is the one-on-one -on -one interactions aren't always working anymore, but rather we're having the advantage and this advantage at times of technology that are helping us create this new society. Generation Z at the end of the day, it's called digital natives for a reason and digital learners. It's because they're using technology in ways that we've never been able to do before. Yeah. yeah. A, a huge... if, I can, if I can add one quick thing to what Freddie was saying, I think, you know, when students are deciding which college to attend, given, you know, the pandemic, you know, the college choice becomes even more important, mm -hmm. right? Because yeah. you have to realize that this is, you know, like maybe this is going to fast track, like our technology, technological advances, <clears throat> because school, schools or universities that are left behind, you know, they have, have not built the digital infrastructure. I don't know how, what they're going to do, you know, and you were talking about, you know, not being able to go on campus and maybe not being able to have an interactive session, you know, through the, through the iPad or through a platform with the professors have already been teaching on for eight years. You know, like a university like Lynn, for us, it was just kind of, uh, you know, we went from, from Monday to Tuesday, you know, when we had to close the campus. It was just almost like natural for us because that's what we've been preparing to do for so many, for so many years, right? So when you look at a, at a university as a parent, as, a, as an independent uh, counselor, as a, as a high school counselor, I think you have to think of those things, right? Yeah. What, yeah. what are you going to get from, from your experience uh, should something like COVID-19 happen? I, I, I'm going to close on my point. Like I, I, we had a session uh, the other day with uh, uh, with some of our student athletes, and, and one of them said a very, very nice thing. She said, "I picked Lynn because I thought that Lynn would be the best place if I couldn't play the sport that I came here to play. It would be the place that I would love to be uh, at, even if I if I couldn't do that." Sure enough, she had two ACL, uh, 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 she broke the, you know, her ACL twice. Uh, and she said, uh, you know, I would never have left Lynn because the, I picked the university based on what I wanted, you know, as the overall experience, not just for soccer. I picked Lynn University because I thought it, that I could get the best possible experience uh, from all aspects, from a social perspective, from an academic perspective, from an athletic perspective. Yeah, yeah, definitely so. I want to take just a second here and give a shout out to Megan from Orange high school um hi, Megan. Say, yeah so thank you for joining us right she's uh she's saying hi so pretty excited that that she's joining us today um yeah you know back to one thing you mentioned freddie earlier um you know colleges are not designed and universities have never been designed for social distancing you know not not as not a single one has been created uh, with the expectation that when, camp when students get on campus that they should stay away from each other. In fact, almost every program you think about and every residence hall can architect construction, any, any type of you know, pre-planning of how we're going to create a new student center, all of it revolves around bringing students together, not separating. Um, and that's, that's the, been the experience of campuses across the world is to bring students together, not only of different backgrounds, but to interact and learn from one another. Uh, you know, Savannah, you're, you're sitting at least in a picture, right? Not, not physically, but at least in a picture in front of a building uh, that was designed to bring students, yeah, right over your shoulder, right? Uh, was designed to bring students together and to interact and to uh, collaborate together. Um, and so this is, this is one of the biggest uh, transitions, I think, that campuses are having to kind of rethink um, in what it's going to look like at, at minimum this fall, but even ongoing, uh, of what it looks like to utilize their resources, uh, both as uh, residents, dining, um, educating, the whole nine yards, on how they, they exercise uh, their social distancing. Yeah, but I mean, hopefully this is gonna be a blip in history, right? Yes, and yes. It's gonna, it's gonna be one of those things that we're gonna study in the, in the history books that we're going to you know, talk about maybe in, a, a, in a, what, a, a other 100 or 150 years, we're gonna talk about, oh, remember when uh, you know, there was COVID and now there's a, you know, so 
you know, we're going to be able, because I mean, I, I think universities are not designed to have social distancing. A human, a human, uh, um, human people, like, uh, you know, the, our humankind is not designed to social distance. We're designed to be together. We're designed to, to be in, in our own villages, right? In our tribes and, uh, and, and connect with one another and make meaningful, you know, bring meaningful relationships and, and create, uh, you know, ideas that then become, you know, the inventions and the beautiful, you know, countries and historical sites and uh, books and uh, and music that we have been uh, creating, you know, for, um, you know, for, 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 for thousands of years. So, you know, I mean, yes, we're talking about something that is very real. It's, it's, it's now, but I'm hoping that with, with six, you know, in six months, this is just going to be a, uh, you know, a, a nightmare that, uh, that we will have uh, forgotten. Yeah. yeah. Freddie, any thoughts there? No, and I couldn't agree more with Stefano. And I think, again, the silver lining behind COVID-19, it's a few aspects. Stefano mentioned it best. We are not designed as human beings to be away from other human beings. One of the things that surprised me is this is probably the first time I've been at this long at home without traveling for weeks. And I guess, first of all, I just realized how basic I am that I just got cable again. And I realized I had to buy a vacuum. I had to buy rugs because I'm always out on the road trying to find the mission for the university to, with other students. But even today, I opened the window and I saw students playing basketball, playing football. I've never saw that before. I think from the silver lining with COVID-19, one, we're bringing families closer together. We're having dinners again. Yeah. And secondly, it's an, it, first of all, I can't stress this enough how unfortunate, it's such an unfortunate circumstance that people are losing their jobs People are losing their careers. They don't know if they're going to have meals on their plate next week, uh, the roof over their head. But this is also an amazing time within admission and within colleges, within high schools. Let's reinvent education. Let's figure out what worked, what hasn't worked. For example, and let me ask you a question, Mark. You're an independent counselor yourself. I, Stefano and I travel extensively. And we notice that a lot of public schools, you can enter a class, a uh, guidance counselor's office or a college counselor's office, and we may have 15 or 20 students in one room. Again, we know that those individuals, unfortunately, they're overworked, understaffed, and there's only 24 hours in a day. To your point about the international population, what are you seeing from the high school side? Because at the end of the day, yes, although international students do attend college in the United States, there's also a tremendous amount of international students on the high school side. What trends are you seeing within that realm? And with as educators ourselves, how can we help assist that effort? Because at the end of the day, I, and again, I hope both of you are right, and I hope COVID-19 is just a little blimp in history three, four, five, six months from now. But with us having this opportunity to sit back, not be within our own facilities, and really start questioning certain parts of academics to make the experience stronger for students, what trends are you seeing from the high school side since Stefan and I are on the trenches for the college. I'm curious to know your thoughts from the high school side. Yeah, and, and of course, it's important to recognize that I, I of course, Freddie, I'm not in a high school uh, because I, I do independent consulting, but a lot of my high school counselor friends that uh, I rub shoulders with quite often and absolutely love their work, um, you know, they're, they're going to have some challenges um, moving forward with how they welcome uh, college reps mm -hmm. onto their campus. Um, there's going to be a challenge with what college fairs look like when, um, you know, multiple people are coming into a, a gymnasium or a, a center where they're, they've got multiple tables out for college fairs. It's going to be a little, a little interesting. I mean, we've seen a, a little bit of that transformation take place with regards to how we visit campuses. Um, by, by, by way of these virtual tours uh, that we've seen. Uh, we've been able to kind of experience the campus in a new way. Um, you know, some, some college admissions uh, officers are saying, why, 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 why haven't we been doing this all along? Because, right, yeah. right? And so, you know, one of, the, one of the real important, I think, to your credit, Freddie, of mentioning, is that as a result of this COVID experience, we are now as uh, professionals in higher education, those of you who are 
behind the scenes and, and running the ship in admissions uh, are able to think through why it is we do what we do, how it is we do what we do, and how can we do it better for the purposes that we need it to be done today, as opposed to how it was done a year ago or two years ago, or in our case, three months ago. Um, and, and, and providing a product that is uh, very unique, but provides information in a, a method of delivery that makes sense for students and families to get to know who you are. And that means doing things different. Uh, one thing, for instance, uh, you guys are here with me today, and I'm so grateful that you're here, but this is one of those ways that you do get to deliver a different message, uh, or at least deliver your message in a different manner. Uh, that's, that's fantastic. Um, and, 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 and we're starting to kind of think outside the box, much like all of you have. Um, and so that would be, in my opinion, uh, how we're you know, kind of moving forward in, in, in delivering some of the, these, uh, these, these, you know, this, this information. Mark, there was a, uh, an ancient uh, Greek philosopher by the name of Heraclitus. That's that, uh, you know, one of his uh, uh, quotes was the only constant thing in the world is change, right? Yeah. yeah. And uh, only and that's, True, you know, it was true like uh, three thousand years ago when he uh, when he said it, and it's even more true today when change happens uh, even more quickly than uh, than it ever has in 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 history. So it's very, um, I think, clear to see, you know, wh which direction we're heading towards, right? Yeah. And only the you know the any organization any. Um, you know, even in in uh, in your organization, independent counseling, I'm sure that you have to adapt. You yeah. know, to how the students are changing. You can't uh, uh, counsel like you did maybe 10 years ago because the students are just different, right? They want they want different things. So, so I I, I think that that's what we're going to see. And and uh, and uh, um, you know, Freddie is absolutely right. We'll see a um, fast forwarding of uh, institutions really starting to think outside the box and doing things that before, you know, they didn't need to do because, you know, things were going well and they were just, uh, uh, you know, going through the motions. Yeah. And now you can't do that anymore. You know, only the in institutions and organizations that are really adapting to change are going to be able to thrive, um, you know, moving forward. And it, and it had already started in a big way, but I think it's going to be um, um, compounded by, by this crisis. Yeah, our viewers are actually mentioning a couple of things that are very significant where they're, they're just in conversations and in high school uh, where in their counseling areas where they're, they're talking about virtual meetings with college reps. They're talking about larger rooms uh, when they have meetings with college reps. Uh, so these small rooms that they've been placed in um, with multiple students at one time will probably be on the, on the wayside. And they're hearing, they're hearing that a lot of travel budgets are going to be cut. And that makes total sense, right? Because as, as a campus in, in higher education, when things get tough and the tough gets going, budgets are the first one thing that gets put under the microscope. And we start to, to trim the fat off. And so those, those budgets are being cut at schools. And there's going to be less reps face-to-face, -face, regardless of how things progress. And this, this, this means that even college admissions might even look a little different as a result, not just higher education as a whole, but even college admissions as we have known it uh, with travel seasons and travel schedules and uh, areas of representation. And maybe, maybe even dare I say, the number of college admissions reps in an office uh, may change. Uh, and that's not necessarily good news, but um, but it's, it's all about streamlining and rethinking why we do, again, what we do, how mm -hmm. we do what we do, and uh, for the most optimal results. Yeah, you said something very interesting, Mark, before. Um, you know, a lot of those things that we're doing now, like, you know, this Zoom meeting would never have happened, right? Oh. Uh, if we didn't have uh, uh, COVID. So, uh, you know, that's the silver lining that Freddie was talking about. But I think we're going to keep on doing that. I mean, we've realized... Just in the month of May at Lynn, we have uh, um, 
uh, given about 35 different uh, Zoom sessions um, to our prospective students, parents, uh, families, uh, high school counselors. Uh, and we've touched over 2,000 people in, in less than a month, right? That, it, that would not have happened, you know, had we been on, uh, um, on campus because there's just not that many people uh, that, uh, that, that are going to take, you know, a, a, a tour uh, to South Florida to visit the campus. And we've been able to, to attract so many more people and more people have been able to listen to what we had to say you know, the message that we had, uh, and we have an incredible faculty that was willing to jump right in and start connecting with students, uh, you know, for every single major. So I think that part of, of the success that we've had this year is due to the fact that we were able to really transform ourselves, uh, you know, transform the, the admission um, office uh, on a dime. I mean, before we left the office, so we were told that we had to, uh, you know, stop working on a, on a Friday, that Saturday, we put together this incredible program. It was an, a live open house that we'd never done before. So we'd never even tried uh, a, a Zoom meeting. So we were there with, with literally with our iPhones, with our ear, uh, ear, earbuds and scotch tape. And we had this program that was, that looked like a CNN, a professional, um, uh, you know, live stream from from Lynn University, you know, with different uh, areas for different professors, different staff members that came in and gave uh, a full, and we attracted 500 uh, people that that logged in, uh, you know, into into that session. I mean, that would never have happened, you know, had we not to start thinking outside the box. And that's the, you know, that's the beauty of 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 the humankind that we always tend to reinvent uh, ourselves, right? If if we have, you know, anything that happens to us, you know, sometimes. We do it just because, you know, we, we try to think about this. Sometimes we're forced to do this, right? So, yeah, very good point that you that you brought up before. I mean, the, 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 these sessions are not going away. No. And, and even at the end of the day, just to reiterate Stefano's point, and I think going to your point as well, Mark, is why we do what we do. I think it's important for families to also remember how are colleges making them feel during this pandemic? Because at the end of the day, an institution is only going to be successful based on the people behind it. And that's something that we've been fortunate at Lynn that we've always had instilled in our minds that it's people first. I'll give an example. And one of the things I'm very proud of within our community, and again, I've only worked at Lynn University, so I can only speak from one uh, viewpoint, but we don't provide tenure. To me, it's incredible how these faculty members are coming along to virtual sessions outside of the norm nine to five. We have deans coming in. We have associate professors, associate deans, these are individuals that care. And at the end of the day, I think that's something that, that families should be looking at as we discussed. We hope that this is just gonna be six months from now, we'll be laughing at this. Hopefully we'll be in Atlanta, Georgia, grabbing food, laughing about the situation. But families need to figure out how did schools make me feel during this pandemic? Se juniors, seniors, because at the end of the day, people drive an institution, people drive education. And at the end of the day, we're all human beings educating other human beings. Right. Yeah, and, and, and you know, I, I think this all sums up to, and I think it, I was reminded today uh, in another uh, webinar that I was a part of, uh, that, that one of the best silver linings that can come out of all of this, and we'll, we'll, we'll go with this in closing because we're right at our, uh, our time, but, but, but the silver lining for me in this, and I think in higher education, I think at, at the high school level, I think um, in the individual college level, when you start to get into your offices, but even more so even as students at the individual level is how we can begin to look at the things that we've taken for granted in our lives and that, mm -hmm. that we now have either been redirected uh, around or that you know, we're, we're starting to have to do different and we're having to think outside the box. And many of our students um, are having to make decisions or in the process of making decisions on where they wanna go to college um, or if they're gonna go to college. 
And they're starting to reevaluate a lot of that. And even some of the current college students are trying to decide, should I stay or should I go now? Um, you know, should I, <laughs> is that a song? I think that's a song. Uh, but you know, they're trying to make these big decisions and they've got to, got to start stepping outside of the box and identifying those things that are really important to them in this process. And this has really caused us to drill down on those things in our own personal lives that are very, very important to us. Uh, colleges and universities across the country are starting to do the very same thing with budget cuts, finding what it is uh, that is so very important to their campus and to their brand and to their to their livelihood there. Uh, they're looking unfortunately at, at faculty and staff that are necessary and not so necessary anymore because of the changes that they're having to make. And these are good things. This is not a bad thing. This is a good thing because, uh, you know, they always say a, a pig with less fat runs a whole lot faster, right? So, you know, when they start trimming it off, that's good. So uh, that's, that's a good thing. Guys, I am so super grateful and thankful that you guys are uh, with us tonight and glad that you took the time out of your busy, busy schedules. Uh, you, have a, you have a college to recruit for and um, doing a fantastic job. And thank you for your time here. I wanna thank all of our viewers for uh, spending time with us today. And uh, why don't you guys tell us, um, Stefana, why don't you give us a, an idea of how uh, families can get in touch with you uh, if they want to uh, learn more about Lynn University. What would they do to do that? So um, we have uh, uh, developed uh, this incredible, and, and as you say, Mark, uh, you know, you have to reinvent yourself when uh, uh, things happen, right? Uh, and one of the things that I'm very, very proud of our team is that we've really been able to do that incredibly quickly. And we've put together with the help uh, uh, of the people of Lynn University, this incredible virtual program that we have uh, um, started, uh, 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 you know, giving uh, to 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 anyone that was that, that was interested. Uh, the the day, uh, pretty much the day that uh, uh, COVID hit, and we had to uh, we had to get home. And we have a, a ton of programming that uh, can be seen, uh, uh, you know, recorded. And we have a ton of programming that is going to take place live. Uh, so uh, if uh, anyone that is interested in Lynn would like to learn more about Lynn, I would suggest uh, uh, going to lynn.edu uh, uh, slash visit. And uh, we have a list of all the programs uh, that are going to be uh, uh, put together in the, uh, you know, in the next few uh, weeks, in the next few days, uh, uh, you know, all throughout the summer. And we have a number of virtual uh uh, you know, obviously we have a virtual tour. We have a number of videos that students can uh, and parents uh, and families and counselors can take a look at uh, to really get the, uh, you know, the understanding of uh, really how different Lynn is from other institution of its, uh, you know, of its kind. And, uh, you know, we're very proud of what we're doing. And uh, as soon as the campus opens up, uh, um, uh, you need to come and visit because it's truly an experience in and of itself. You know, we have developed this campus visit experience uh, that it's absolutely unique and it's custom designed for each and every family based on what their their needs uh, and desires are. It's truly it's really an outstanding institution that uh, uh, you know I I believe and obviously I am partial to the institution. You know I've been working uh, at Lynn for a long time. I'm a Lynn uh, um, alumnus, uh, but it's truly uh, you know at a you know works at a different pace uh, rather than uh, you know than 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 uh, you know compared to other institutions. So. Uh, we would love to uh, to have you contact us, reach out to us if you have any any specific questions, uh, and uh, and we'll be happy to uh, you know to answer them and uh, uh, point you in the right direction. Lynn is not the right match for everyone, but maybe it is the right match for some of you. That's awesome. Thank you guys so much. I have posted for our viewers in uh, the comment section uh, the link that Stefano mentioned uh, that lynn.edu backslash visit, and so you can find that information directly there and you can go to it there. Freddie, thank you so much for visiting. Thank you for your comments and insight. Uh, we certainly do appreciate it. You guys have a wonderful evening tonight. Have a great week and uh, good luck moving into this next semester uh, with all your recruiting efforts and, um, and hope everything goes excellent for y'all. Thank you again. Thank right. you for having us, Mark. Mark. All right, we'll see you. Best bye. of luck to you. Bye.